The meeting will now come to order. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Mrs. Almond, you please call the roll. Director Conley. Here. Director Emig. Here. Director Hogan. Here. Director Kindig. Here. Director McKinney. Present. Director Meese. Here. Director Miller. Here. <clears throat> Director Whitmer. Here. Director Wolverton. Here. Nine present. Thank you, Mrs. Allman. I'd like to welcome the members of the public that are here with us tonight, as well as our presenters. We'll have four presentations tonight. And uh, We'll get started with the first one, agenda item 2.01, the student body representatives report. Uh, Ms. Brooklyn Orr and Luke Mabius. Are they here? They are not here tonight. Well, we're down to three presentations. We'll uh, go to the next agenda item, the Veterans Memorial Project. Mr. Brad Jacobs, you're recognized. Good evening, Dr. Cartwright, President Conley, and members of the school board. Thanks for, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present an update for the Dover High School Veterans Memorial Project. My name is Brad Jacobs. I'm a graduate of Dover High School in the class of 62. Some of you are starting to count on your fingers. I'm 79 years old. I'll be 80 in July. And I have a classmate back here. Surprise me. My last presentation to the school board was in June 30th of 2023. Since there are several new members of the board, I will share some history of the project and some very exciting news. On January 18th, 2018, I wrote a memo to the administration and the school board members for my idea of a veterans memorial. My grandsons are students at Central Dolphin High School. When they were in elementary school, their music programs were held at that high school. As you enter the high school, there's a veterans memorial near the main entrance. As a former commissioned officer in the armed forces, that Central Dolphin High School memorial gave me this idea. And since the district was considering a construction of a new high school, I thought it would be a suitable time that the district consider a memorial to honor the service and sacrifice of veterans. My, my memo went on to say to the school board, if they're agreeable, I would be willing to sh chair a committee that would solicit contributions for the cost of the memorial, and I would put together a committee to discuss concepts for the design and capital fundraising. Subsequently, the new high school plans were approved, and the authority was given to me to proceed with plans with the Dover Eagle Foundation, a 501c3, as a fiscal sponsor. Murphy Dittenhafer Architects of York were engaged. Frank Dittenhafer, president and founder of that firm, is also a graduate of Dover High School and started work on the design. The Veterans Memorial Committee was established and the first meeting was held in May of 2018. 13 members attended those meetings, including teachers of the district who served in the military, administrators, community members, the district architect also attended. We were meeting monthly until the COVID pandemic arrived. In September of 2018, we had the first Murphy Dittenhafer design, which the committee accepted, and the cost estimate was $114,000, which is what you see in front of you. The capital campaign started in November of 2018. Local print media and TV stations ran stories about the project. Renditions of the memorial were made for displaying at various functions and a brochure which I gave you uh, describing the memorial and how to contribute was produced. 
Our first contributions were received in 2019. One thing I could never have predicted was a worldwide pandemic reducing capital fundraising for two years, 20 and 21. Not all projects have done so well coming out of that pandemic. However, I'm most pleased what we have accomplished during, after the pandemic. The community, businesses, foundations, veterans, American legions, VFWs have been very supportive since the project was first announced in late 2018. Those two lost years because of that pandemic had increased the cost estimate for the memorial to $180,000. To date, the committee has raised $184,949.56 and not, not a single dollar has been spent. We have the following contractors engaged for the project with contracts ready for signature. Real Services Incorporated is our general contractor. York Excavating Company is the excavation, backfill, and final grading. ASCOM Electric here in Dover will provide the electric service to light the memorial. Gingrich Memorials will be supplying the granite. The total contract cost is $175,092. So we have roughly a little over $9,800 in excess. There is an educational component to this Veterans Memorial. The Brookings Institute noted in 2020 Americans participated in civic life is essential to sustaining our democratic form of government. Without it, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people will not last. However, today's understanding of basic civil knowledge is lacking. Simply put, there is a dire need for students to better understand civic engagement and the importance of public service. The Murphy didn't heart Ditton Hafer Architects Design Memorial will allow teachers to add personal names and stories to the historical significance of America's conflicts by incorporating local veterans into their educational plans. Teachers will be able to take students to the memorial and instruct them about the various branches of the military and the role that those branches played in the history of our America. It is intended that the memorial will enhance student interest in genuine civic engagement and public service both so desperately needed today. Finally, a legal document by your solicitor will enable the Eagle Foundation to have an easement granted by the school district to allow for the foundation to maintain the memorial and to be able to access to place newly sponsored pavers at the memorial. Also, the foundation needs legal direction as to who should sign the contracts to construct the memorial. I've spoken to Attorney Pratt about this document and asked that you give him the authority to draft that proposal uh, for your approval. We anticipate breaking ground in May of this year and construction in June or July when school is closed. Dedication would be on Veterans Day, November 11th, which is a Monday. Depending on whether estimate time for completion of the project is four weeks, granite is the most important uh, part of the project in order to get it ordered or as early as possible for the construction timeline. We also would like to place a sign at the site for the groundbreaking announcing the construction timeline, including a copy of the rendition of the memorial and the contractor's names. I want to thank the past administrations and school board directors over these past seven years for their continuous support for the project. Memorials speak to us as though to say, don't forget us, and Dover will not. As Gordon Freirich wrote in his York Sunday News editorial of September 19th, 2019, it was entitled, and I quote, every day could be Veterans Day in Dover, and that's gonna come to fruition. Hard work does make dreams come true. Those six words mean, meant a lot to me in my adult life. And I shared those six words with the graduating class of 2012, in 2022 when I spoke at their graduation ceremony. I told them those are the only six words they need to remember from my remarks, because they will succeed with those six words. The quote on the left side of the memorial was by Abraham Lincoln, and I'll quote, I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives. I like to see a man live that his place will be proud of him. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. And if not, I will get back to you, um, to the board with that answer. And again, I thank you for your support. And I look forward to June and July and November 11th. Is there any questions?
Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Board have any questions? Comments? Just want to comment that I I love the educational aspect to you with the local you. ties to veterans. That's that's public amazing. service and yeah. civic engagement. Mm -hmm. So much needed. Can we talk a little bit with the solicitor regarding the legal respect to go forward? Or would you like to do that now? Or? Well, just, you know, what I'm ready to sign contracts, but I don't know if we, I, I can't sign, I'm not, a, I'm not president of the Eagle Foundation, but um, it's, it's on the school property, you know, does, we're paying for it, the Eagle Foundation, who should sign the contracts? We're going to have to figure that part out based on the fact that it's school property it's through the foundation, but it's also through this group. So we'd have to just draft up some documents to make sure, plus the easement that we'd have to give them to allow access to do the construction as well as Eas uh, easement thereafter. And thereafter, correct. But that, that would be the gist of the work. I talked to Mr. Jacobs already a little bit about this and just have to double check on to who would be the, have the authority to sign the agreements and then we can move forward with that. You know, the quicker we can sign those, you know, we, we'll meet our construction timeline because we'd like to build while school was closed. I understand there's a band camp, I believe, in part of the parking lot there, but we shouldn't uh, cause any issues for that. Okay, I'd like to ask Dr. Cartwright, do we have any summer school planned at the high school during this time period? I don't believe there's <clears throat> any summer school. If you I come in, I, I talked. Is the biggest. I'm sorry. It's okay. I think I, band camp is our biggest concern on the parking lot. Correct. In the summer. Besides regular sports starting in, in August. It's a, we figure a four week construction period, weather permitting. And we're in that northern, if you come in the last driveway off of Intermediate Avenue and you come down, we're in that little quadrant where the um, the gym, what's it? There's a gym. Auxiliary gym. gym. Yeah, there's a sidewalk that comes out there, and we're sitting in that little quadrant there. Okay, uh, Mr. Pratt, should he reach out to you individually, or will you reach out to him uh, concerning draft agreements? Mr. Jacobs can reach out to me. We can okay. get that started. Okay. Thank you. I thank you for the time. All right, thank you. I'd like to commend you, you on the fundraising. Raising $185,000 is not an easy thing. I don't know if you had a lot of people helping you, but we you will did be, it alone. It's even more commendable. We will be um, putting on the on that black piece of granite. I, I should tell you, there's a couple of different changes. The eagle, the eagle on this. <clears throat> backside of that black granite will now be on the front side here where that flag is. And on the back side of this black granite uh, will be the names contributors of Thousand Dollar Global. Not in any category, just random across that. Okay. Excellent. Right. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any other, before you leave, any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Thank you very much. Next, we have a presentation from Makerspace uh, Live Elementary students. Good evening, my name is Jody Wickenheiser and it is my pleasure to serve the Dover Area School District as the principal of Live Elementary School. It is my absolute privilege to have Mrs. Houlihan and several of our amazing Live students here this evening. Mrs. Houlihan is a teacher of Makerspace. All students K through five go to Makerspace once every six days in their cycle. So these students are going to be working with you to show to for you for them to show you all the hard work they have done with their STEM projects. Put that down a little bit. <laughs> okay, so Makerspace is a relatively new encore. Um, I have a script. I don't do great sticking to it, but. So in general, we have four units that we cover. We start with collaboration because I think it's really important that the students learn how to work together. 
Um, then we move into unit two, which is coding and robots. And in unit three, which is where we're currently existing, is design thinking. And in unit four, we're going to be working on digital communication, focusing on um, using Seesaw, using Schoology, the digital citizenship, all that stuff, and how we can show our learning digitally. So we are currently focusing on the engineering design process, which is part of those new steels, because we know there's like a huge amount of steels. So we did grab some of those. I believe it is band 3.5, engineering and technology. So we are using a bunch of those this year. It's our first time using them. Um, but they do focus on engineering design process, which would be ask, imagine, plan, create, and improve. So we've been focusing not on K through five, everyone's doing it. If you ask my kindergartners and we say engineering design process, they all go engineering design process, but with them we do ask, plan, and create. So they have a smaller version of it. And as we get to third, fourth, and fifth grade, then we expand on that and we do more of the research part to it. So for this project, I ask each grade level to solve a challenge. Uh, next, they use some curated resources. We don't have a ton of time in the Encore schedule. We have 40 minutes, so I do curate resources for them, and then they can use those resources to start planning their project. Um, and each of the projects looks a little different at each grade level, so we do have, today you'll see three different projects, a third, a fourth, and a fifth grade project. And depending on that project, sometimes it takes students a little bit longer. I've encouraged the students that I would rather them take longer to create a project that they are proud of that has good construction and craftsmanship and is well thought out than to rush through it to get to the final project of the year, which is stop motion animation, which is super cool, but we are, uh, oh, we'll get to that. Um, so they are currently in this phase of create and improve, and we are really working on, we're creating right now, but then does it work? How do I improve that? So we go back and we create again. We plan, we create, improve, and it is a cycle that they are learning to work through. So the projects that you see here are this. This is our first time doing it. I'm super psyched. I think the projects are great. I asked one fifth grade class, I was like, do we do this next year? And they're like, yes. So it's going really well. So I could go on forever, but I will let my students talk. Uh, we have four students. A lot of our students volunteered. We chose four to talk about their projects. From third grade in Mrs. Schaefer's room, we have Kenzie Marshall. From fourth grade in Mrs. Dull's room, we have Connor Gower. And from fifth grade in Mrs. Ber Ms. Berger's room, we have Brinley Longenberger and Scarlett Adams, who chose to work as a partner, which I encourage because it's important, again, to collaborate. So I'm going to have them come up because their scripts are up here. So come on up, guys. Stand in your spot. So Connor, come on up. Yep. Okay. So our first step of this unit is called engineer cardboard engineering. Scarlet. Oh, hold on, Scarlet. Mr. Boy said I could bring this over here, so. Okay, go ahead. We learned how to attach paper and cardboard in different ways to prepare us for a design thinking project. We cut tabs on a piece of paper and fold them in opposite directions to turn it into into a standing wall. We also cut tabs on a piece of paper and fold them in the same direction and called them a fling to create a standing cylinder. We use masking tape as an L brace to create a bouncy bridge with, pa with the paper. The L brace gives a structure more support. We use we used two pieces of cardboard, cut it, cut a line in each, and put them together to create a cardboard stand. Oh, the next one's me. Okay. So that was like the beginning part to this, so that they knew how to make those construction pieces. So they had a little bit of uh, information going in. All right. Ooh. Next, we'll talk about the projects that they're working on. So keep in mind, we are mid-project. So we are still working, we're still creating, we are still improving. So these are not done yet. In fifth grade, we had to create a game out of cardboard. We had options to choose from, and then we had to figure out how to make it. We made a sketch and supplies list and got started. We are making a 
pinball machine. Okay, so they made the pin, uh, pinball machine. What supplies did you use? The supplies we used, we used popsicle sticks, we used cardboard, we used pinballs, and we used rubber bands, tape, masking tape, and markers. And duct tape. Oh, yeah, duct tape. Duct tape's great. Yes. Um, did you have any challenges while you were making this game? Yes. Yes, indeed. We had lots of challenges. Um, at one point with the cardboard tubes, we actually used hot glue, but the cardboard was really thin, so it was really hard to hot glue the cardboard with the hot glue. So instead, we made a workaround and used duct tape instead. Thank you, girls. Good job. Okay. Connor. In fourth grade, we had we had to create a roller coaster out of cardboard. Review we reviewed potential and kinetic energy, which we talked about in science class. We looked at some ideas, then came up with our own design. We had to meet with Miss Houlihan to talk about our design. Then we were able to shop for our supplies and get started. This is my roller coaster. Okay, so where does your ball start? It starts right. It starts right here. And what supplies did you use? I used um, cardboard, uh, two plates, staples, a uh, duct tape, hot glue. That's about it. So do you want to show it to them, and then we'll talk about any challenges? Okay. So, so is that supposed? To be? Oh. 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 Thanks, Ken. Well, I, I thought it was that again. Okay. Yep, that again. We were doing it on the other side before. Ooh, ah. Oh, that was a good one. It went right through. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, Connor, do you have any challenges that you're currently working on trying to fix? Yes, I have a couple challenges. Um, the first challenge was the for the speed before, before um. It, it, it went too fast and it went over it, yeah. but I added tape right there so it can slow it down. So when it goes down, it slows it down. Which was a brand new addition when we came in here, right? Because duct tape fixes everything, doesn't it? But then the second problem was um, the edges right here are too slanted. Like right here, or the ball kept falling off and I used, got stuck right here and then, and then it moved. But I put masking uh, duct tape over it, and then it could work. And then the third problem is sometimes the ball gets stuck right here because the cardboard tube uh, right here is a little bit further out than right here. So the when the sometimes the ball where's the ball sometimes it gets stuck. That's gonna work every single time. <laughs> it gets stuck. Right, it gets stuck right there. It gets stuck right there sometimes, but I, for the most part, it, it keeps working a lot. Yeah. Falls down, and then it gets stuck right there, and I'm not finished with it. I'm planning the what, this, another tube can go around here, and then it stops right there in the corner. Good job, Connor. Great. Thank you. Okay, and now we have third grade. Kenzie. In third grade, we have to design our own board games. We are doing through the step together, create design game piece, pieces and the game board. My game is called Legoland. So do you have a plan for your game? Yes, it starts here. And you spin the spinner, and if you land, say I landed on red, you would move to red. And if you landed on wild, you would go to the jail. And to get out of the jail, you would have to get the dice and roll a 12 to get out of the jail. And the dice we created on the 3D printer. So the students, um, I pulled up Tinkercad, and they were able to choose which dice they wanted to make. And they could pull it over onto the work area. And then we would print them out, and then they are able to color them with Sharpies. But they had to think, like, which dice I use, because she chose a 12-sided dice. So how are we going to use the 12, the number 12? Okay. 
Um, other questions. So, how are you going to make your game pieces? I'm th I thought of making a like Lego like gears in a way, but that was too hard to draw. So then I tried to do Lego characters, but then I kept messing up and but I kept trying and trying. But then I thought of game chips. They're easy and they're just nice. And what are you gonna make your game pieces out of? The three D pens. So they will, this is their introduction to using 3D pens as well. So they do their drawing, we make a template, and then they'll create their game pieces for their games. And theirs had to fit inside a Ziploc baggie because I was running out of storage after all this. So, yeah. Okay. Good? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great job, great job presenting. You did a fantastic job, and these are very interesting projects that you built here. So we're very proud of you. I'd like, if you're okay with it, I'd like to give the board an opportunity to ask you maybe some questions and make some comments. So anyone from the board like to make a comment? I just want to see that 12-sided dice if possible. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else from the board have a comment to make? Well, I just love seeing the students get these problem solving skills that where they can figure out problems and it's going to help them be the leaders of the world. And Connor, don't forget about the duct tape. That's going to help you all through life. <laughs> yes. Teach them about WD-40 also. <laughs> Donations of duct tape, always welcome. Okay. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is uh, Mr. Brad Jacobs is going to be recognized once again for a Veterans Memorial update. I did. Is this, it's on here twice? Okay. All right. So it's just, just uh, extraneous entry. You can always present again, right? No. Okay. All right. We'll give them just a moment to uh, clean things up and move things out. We want to roll that table out. It's fine there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have no problem getting it. <laughs> it's probably okay. All right, this brings us to our first public comment period. The board uses the public comment period as an opportunity to listen, but not to debate issues or enter into a question and answer session with the speaker. Public comment must be germane to school district business, board values, civil, respectful statements, and clear and concise communication that helps to inform its deliberations. Each commenter will have three minutes to make their presentation of comments. Uh, just a reminder, we also have a second comment period, which will be towards the end of the meeting uh, with an additional two minutes of time at that point in time. When you come to the microphone, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, just please state your name. And if you have not already uh, registered on the sign-in sheet, just state your address as well. Hello, my name is Gina Myers. And I'm a resident of Dover. I live on Rollers Church Road. Um, I've actually lived here 30 years. And my husband, I think he was going to try to come, but um, I don't see him. He's lived in Dover all his life, been a taxpayer all that time, too. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you, uh, directors, administrators, school officials, teachers in the audience, maybe. Um, Thank you so much for your service to the community. It's not easy what you do, and I want to thank you sincerely uh, for it. Thank you so much for your service. Um, as a resident of Dover Township for many years, I like to ask the school directors to not raise taxes. 
These are hard economic times for everyone, and inflation is at its highest in 40 years. Food and gas prices are through the roof, and people, especially seniors on fixed income, are having a hard time making ends meet. The newest members of the school board ran on a platform of fiscal responsibility, accountability, and sensible budget and traditional curriculum. I support all of that. In fact, nearly 80% of the 20,000 voters in the Dover Area School District overwhelmingly voted in favor of your platform last year on November 7th. That's nearly 16,000 people, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, who voted for fiscal responsibility and accountability. Please remember the 16,000 people who voted in, uh, at the ballot box when you deliberate on whether or not to raise taxes. To the people who are advocating uh, for higher taxes, I would say they may have good intentions, but raising taxes for everyone may not be the only solution. Combination of solutions may be necessary. Uh, eliminate waste, inefficiencies, duplicate programs to the extent that there are duplicates. I don't know. Um, I leave it up to you guys, um, the directors. That's your job to figure that out. Um, so I would urge that the directors think outside the box. If there are some people who want to pay higher taxes, good for them. They should be allowed to do so. For example, on a tax bill, um, maybe there should be a separate uh, line item that can be added to say, I voluntarily would like to pay an additional amount of $50, $100, $1,000, $10,000, whatever they would like to pay an additional amount, that would be wonderful. Um, and then maybe the tax collector can then deposit the, the separate voluntary payments in a separate account uh, to be used to pay down any bus budget deficit or needs. So um, there are a lot of highly qualified individuals on the school board and in the administration. So Sorry, your time is expired. Okay, please consider other ways. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Vicki Kopchinski, and I am here on behalf of David Hartz Hartzell. He's not able to meet, make it tonight. He had another commitment, another meeting outside of town. So I'm going to read the letter that he has printed out. Due to a previous commitment, I was unable to attend tonight's meeting, but wanted to make a public comment. Contrary to public comments that were made at previous board meetings, mentioning that they were ashamed and disappointed in the cor current school board, I would like to say how grateful I am that this current board takes their duties seriously and tries very hard to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. Many people are trying to convince you to take the easy way out and join in the chorus, saying, yes, raise our taxes. Yes, it is easy when you are spending other people's money. I seriously wonder how many in this course actually live in the school district and would like to be effective and would and who would be effective if their school taxes were increased? This school board has an important decision to make tonight and has to weigh all options as whether or not to impose a tax increase in the Dover area taxpayers. But I am proud to have voted for this school board and am thankful that you have been looking into every other option before considering this. I trust you will be listening to your conscience and not the babbling chorus, and will make the right decision. Remember this, there are many in this community who are not disappointed in our current school board. Please keep up the good work. Sincerely, David Hartzell. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Miller, and I'm a teacher at the high school. I have AP Economics, World History, U.S. Government, several clubs, and I think I have some colleagues with me tonight, uh, some of whom may be familiar faces. 
um, I would really like to address the need for our assistant principal and CTE positions. We need to have two assistant principals in the high school. Um, over the past two years, our administrative team has improved the climate at the high school through prompt, consistent action on student discipline. We deal with fewer serious infractions today because aggression, substance use, and inappropriate behavior concerns are dealt with quickly and consistently by our administrative staff. Having sufficient administrative capacity matters for staff supervision, building morale and communication with families. Building administration uh, communicates monthly through parent newsletters and weekly through a Monday staff communication that comes out like clockwork. I've been in the district for 12 years. This is the first time that has happened is with this administration. Um, building administrators are here when we arrive. They're here when we leave. They probably take work home. I don't know that. Um, they cover a bunch of after-school activities. Just this past Saturday, three building administrators covered the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. mini-thon, in addition to whatever regular sports and musical requirements they had. Today, they helped the building through a sad and shocking incident with candor and grace. With three administrations, even with district help, it was barely enough. I don't know what it would have looked like if we'd only had two. I really don't. No school in York County, even the smallest, has fewer than two assistant principals for these reasons. They do a lot of work, much unseen and unappreciated, but all of it necessary. Assistant principals, counsel students and teachers, contact family, I have a list, cover emergency staff shortages, provide direction to academic departments, evaluate teaching, provide a presence in the halls during class changes, sit in on IEP and 504 meetings, represent school at after hours events, and a whole bunch of other things that I can't list because I don't do that job. Uh, removing an AP position would harm the team's ability to run the building, and it would be to the detriment of our students and staff. Um, the other thing I wanted to just very quickly address was the importance of CTE teachers. CTE classes offer students a range of opportunities in business, agriculture, computer coding, and practical arts. We get reimbursement from the state for a lot of the expenses associated with those programs. Um, those teachers also have FFA, Skills USA, DECO, the morning announcements, and the school store. Those are all career skills, soft skills and hard skills. Um, removing CTE teachers does not make economic sense if you're trying to balance the budget. CTE programs programs get state reimbursement that other programs don't. So if you take away CTE teachers, students still need classes, and you're going to replace them with classes that don't necessarily have state reimbursement. Um, I don't know why we would replace partially reimbursed positions with positions that don't get reimbursement. Um, one rumor stated that students wouldn't get classes and would simply be placed in massive study halls. I disregarded that because I don't know that anybody, like, this board would never just decide to warehouse students in study halls um, when they could be learning something. That would kind of defeat the purpose of school. So I, I'm assuming that's a rumor. Um, but please don't eliminate CTE. It won't save money. It won't help students. I'm sorry, you time. And I'm done. Okay. Thank you Perfect. so much. Um, my name is Terry Marlowe, and I am a district resident. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I'm a parent. Um, additionally, I have been a teacher for 19 years. You guys are familiar with me. I am not used to using this thing, but the past two days have been quite difficult and unable to. I was unable to write this last night um, with everything going on. Um, I'm here today because I'm concerned of a couple items. First, I'm extremely concerned about the discussion of not re replacing Mr. Kromka as the assistant principal, well, the assistant principal position. Unfortunately, today was an example of why we cannot only op operate with just one assistant principal. Today, our school is dealing with a crisis, and it took all hands on deck. Not only did the administrators um, from other buildings come into our building, but our administrators were running ragged trying to deal with the situation as well. Um, Assistant principals also deal with a myriad of things that um, Mrs. Miller listed, but they don't just handle uh, behavior problems. So replacing them with a dean of students wouldn't be very effective. Um, they do instructional leadership, building organization, and crisis management as well. It would be impossible to run a high school with 1,000 students with only one principal. We would be one of the, the only high school in the county that would be trying to do that. Um, a dean of students would also spread our, our administrative too thin because that would leave them with just the uh, discipline and, and instead of also dealing with the administrative stuffs. 
I am also here because the board last week uh, was discussing education rigor in our classrooms. And that is something that, um, for me, I've been here for 19 years and something that I've kind of rallied behind. One problem that I see is that our graduation requirements uh, several years ago, not under this administration, changed. Um, we went from, I believe, 26 credits down to 24. That means that a kid can graduate after their 11th grade year because they're done with their credits. And that's why we have so many early graduates. Yes, that cuts our budget because then we don't have to have the teachers to house them. Um, but we then have students that are now not taking the higher level courses like economics, physics, uh, pre-cal and stuff like that because they don't have to. Um, <clears throat> so I believe that that is something that we need to look at along with keeping CTE. Um, so the thing is, is that our students that are in our CTE program should have the ability to take economics if they're taking in a business program. Our students that are in the CTE program that are in for the computer technology and also the engineering technology do not have to take the um, pre-cal and they also don't have to take physics, which doesn't make sense to me as well. My son did take those. And at this point, we also don't have a physics teacher for next year because our current physics teacher resigned and is going to another district. So I am extremely concerned about that. We also have a lot of students that are going into healthcare that don't get those higher uh, courses because they choose to graduate early. So um, I have more to say. I'll probably email you guys. I wasn't organized because of events of the past two days and my son dealing with them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Marla. 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 Yes. Hi, my name is Laura Whitmer and I did sign in. I understand the reasons why the school board asked the administration for other options and raising taxes, and as a taxpayer, I can appreciate it. However, the three new options administration presented to you, I think we can all agree are not acceptable. Being at the last board meeting and hearing testimony from students, parents, and teachers on how detrimental the new options would be, it is evident that we need to get creative in how we solve the budget deficit. It was mentioned that we need to think outside the box, and I agree. We need to work together, and I believe I have a solution that just might work. Dr. Cartwright, have you contacted the teachers' union for possible solutions? I have a first-hand example of how partnering with teachers' union might help. In another district, they were facing just under a $1 million deficit. The district implemented a number of cuts, but still have a $140,000 shortfall. Without the help of the union, two teachers were going to be furloughed. The union helped propose two ideas to help keep teacher jobs. Although I know Dover is not facing furloughs, it is essentially the same thing by not replacing a music teacher and eliminating two sixth grade positions. Here are two ideas the union presented. The first idea was to reduce tuition reimbursement pool of money from $195,000 to $125,000, saving $70,000 just for that year. The second idea was teachers would accept a half-day reduction in the work year and accompanying a prorated salary reduction. This day would be after the students leave. This, this saved $29,000. If teachers agreed, which we did, the district would avoid the need to furlough. The union then wrote a memorandum of understanding and added it to the contract. As I only have three minutes, I can share more details about this if needed, and I could find out how the business office handled this reduction as well. I will say the union, as a union, we did agree to this reduction, and to be very honest, I did not financially notice a half day unpaid because the district prorated it throughout the year. All administrators, starting at the top with the superintendent and professional teaching staff, took the half day unpaid. As Dover is a bigger district than the one I am talking about, I believe the savings could be larger. I think this might be an idea we should pursue. As we saw at the last board meeting, teachers are coming together to support one another, and I think this would help. The teachers union would need to look at tuition reimbursement and the salary half day reduction and present specifics to the union members. By doing this, teachers will see that a little bit will go a long way. I believe that this budget deficit, all parties need to compromise so we can reach a solution that would be best for everyone. With that being said, if teachers union agrees, I think the board needs to also compromise and use part of the fund balance as well as possibly implement a slight tax increase. As a member of the teachers union, I've seen firsthand how this has helped save jobs. Thank you for being open and looking for creative ideas to balance the budget. We know taking away sports and teachers is not the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilmer. Nathan Eifert, Nicole Court. 
Since taking office in December, certain members of this board have routinely shown contempt for this administration and staff, your predecessors, and your constituents. It is easy to attack others when you either don't know the facts or play fast and loose with them. True leaders don't look for scapegoats, they look for solutions. You've openly admitted that you're learning, and yes, yours is a difficult job. But now that you are getting a better understanding of the real challenges that face us, and not the town rumors, you may have to readjust your thinking and the promises you made. You should now know that the greatest financial issues facing us are the loss of tax revenue from Washington Township and the outrageous expenses related to cyber schools, not building projects and staff contracts. Yet you regularly bring these up, but do you really know the facts supporting the decisions that were made related to them? From what I've observed, you clearly don't. Now that you're aware of the negative impact cyber schools have on our budget, will you rethink your stance of aligning yourselves with those organizations who support them and return the $2,800 you received from a PAC that does? After all, as school directors, you're charged with championing public education, not cyber schools. As far as our administrators and staff go, when you publicly disparage the district without understanding the data, like when you recently compared us to a neighboring district, you're disparaging the people who work hard every day to support all kinds of students and their families. These people are not your adversaries. Stop treating them as such. They've devoted their entire careers to educating others. Allow them to educate you about the world of education. Regarding your constituents, during previous budget discussions, two of you spoke a total of 22 times during public comment. Never once were you publicly called a derogatory name, but at your last meeting, you referred to your constituents as instigators. They're not instigators. They're parents with valid concerns. Unlike most of you, they actually have children in these buildings. Your decisions impact them and they're concerned by what they see. This administration and previous boards have made many difficult decisions and eliminated millions from this budget. While you might think money is being wasted here, it isn't. The meat has already been cut. Now you are cutting into the bone and that's going to be extremely painful. This administrative team, however, has provided you with a solid budget recommendation that reduces that pain, yet you seem to pretend that it doesn't exist when you say you only have three budget options. You have a unique responsibility to serve not just the taxpayers of this district, but more importantly, the students. Remember that every decision you make and every word you say impacts them. The people who've been coming to these meetings are fighting for their children. Now you need to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, President Arthur. Hi, I'm Jennifer McGurn. Um, I signed in on the sheet. I'm a parent, a taxpayer, and a resident. First, I'd like to thank the directors who acknowledge the hard work of the administration in preparing your budget options and those who fo are focused on making cuts that have the least amount of impact on our students and staff. While I'll be among the first to acknowledge that being a school board member is a thankless endeavor, it's important to note that it's a voluntary role that you not only accepted but campaigned for. Referring to concerned citizens as instigators when they request information, show support of programs, and ask the board to be more transparent in their reasoning for certain decisions is uncalled for. I'd like to remind you that several current board members attended many board meetings before sitting in these seats, and they were asking similar questions and making demands going as far as banging on this podium. The former board needed police presence during meetings during COVID while community members came and yelled at them. Some even received personal threats. And this board is upset that the public came to share their thoughts on the music program, staff cuts and budget. Seriously, where were the tears and outrage for the former board when they were enduring this criticism? Some of you said it was unnecessary for so many people to speak to the importance of the music program. I think there's some confusion about why people attended that meeting. People didn't speak because they think your minds are made up or because of some rumor they heard. They speak to be proactive. They speak to explain the impact that program has for you to consider while making tough cuts. One director said they actually felt sorry for the students being misled about the music program being cut. I couldn't disagree more. This is the perfect venue for these students to sharpen public speaking skills and advocate for themselves, two incredibly important life skills. Next, I'd like to address the letter Director Conley read out loud from a concerned citizen. Reading that letter was inappropriate. 
Many of the so-called facts can be easily disputed by speaking with our administration or even doing a quick Google search. I've attended numerous school board meetings in both Maryland and PA where letters to the board are read during the president's report and they are treated as public comment, name and address read aloud. That way the public is aware that they are opinion, not fact. It's inappropriate to pick and choose which correspondence you want to share. I know for a fact this board receives letters in support of a tax increase or using some more fund balance. Why aren't those letters being shared out loud? I also find it very interesting that the comments in that letter are extremely similar to the comments made by Director Connolly in May 2022, saying that while music and extracurriculars are nice, they don't really result in better students. This can also be debunked with a short internet search. Lastly, this board needs to stop playing the blame game with the last board. You're here now, do what you need to do. That school that you complain about constantly needed to be built. Our other school is falling apart and you're seeing the bills come in from that. That other school is, the new school was, is a source of pride for our students and needed to be built. The other one was a danger zone. Thank you, Ms. McGurn. Hi, I'm Katie Reinhardt. I signed in on the sheet out there. Um, good evening, school board members. I am speaking to you tonight as a concerned parent, taxpayer, and citizen in Dover. First, I would like to thank several of you for voicing your concerns against the proposed budget cuts um, last week that you had requested from the administrative team in lieu of raising taxes and using the funds balance. However, even the first tier of the proposed cuts are not a satisfactory satisfactory option for our students and staff. As a parent who volunteers within the district weekly, I can assure you our schools are already operating on a minimum staff level due to the loss of Washington Township and the cuts imposed by the previous board. There is no price tag on education, and I as a parent highly value academics for my children. Continued cuts to our district will be a detriment to our children and their education as well. The current number of staff within our district is already inadequate and our amazing teachers are doing their very best under less than optimal conditions. They are rocking it and trying, but it's hard because they don't have enough. Um, I work professionally also within several Dover schools as well as in other districts and, and it really saddens me the condition that Dover is in compared to the other school districts that I have clients in. Um, we're penny pinching and at a skeleton crew as it stands right now. Adding more budget cuts will only continue to perpetuate the lack of supports for students and teachers within the district. Our teachers are overworked, undervalued, and are exhausted as a result of all of this. Um, cutting positions only furthers this problem and leads teachers to leave our district or leads them to even just leave the profession due to burnout. The focus here seems to be solely on money and funds and not on the students and staff. We need to come together as a district and build up our educational system and not focus on name calling those who do come to these meetings and hold you all accountable and voice their concerns. You resort to labeling individuals as political instigators and these are just parents that want to let you know the concerns that they have. Politics have no place within our school board, none at all. And the interest should be for the children and the staff and not leaning to a political party or any alliances within a political party. I also fear that the board's consultation with the Independence Law Center, who is listed as a political hate group, will only further our budget concerns through litigation against the district. Please do not make the students and staff pay for your campaign promises when there are other ways to do this. Also, just speaking to these individuals that are concerned with the tax increases, um, I have children within the district. <laughs> I know that they're they're old. They don't, and that's that's very important. Like. I have skin in the game. <laughs> so it's very important to me. I'm very passionate about this. My kids are young, elementary level, and I just want to see them continue in Dover. We love Dover. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Good evening. My name is Kenneth Moritz. I'm a Dover resident, 4876 Orchid Way, if you need to know. Uh, I'm kind of in the opposition here. Thank you very much for your service to the school board or the school district. I appreciate that. I voted for you guys. 
and I will continue to do that if I can. I'm opposed to any tax increase. I'm one of the senior citizens that, quote, is on fixed income. You only have so much money. So what do I do when I got to pay more taxes? I got to pull it somewhere else. Well, I think you guys could do that too somehow. And I think you've already tried. And you got blessed. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, things might have happened in the past. Somebody said politics shouldn't be here. Well, I think the last group of people here was really political. But that's my opinion. Uh, thank you. But I'm opposed to a tax increase. Thank you, Mr. Moritz. Oh, no pause. Good evening. <clears throat> my name's Deanna Yinger. My address is in the sign-in. My husband and I have three children who have gone through the Dover area school system. I am here to ask you not to increase taxes this year. My husband and I have witnessed much waste within the schools over our 35 years. So I would hope that we could control some of that waste rather than eliminate a lot of teachers or programs. I'm gonna talk about two areas that I think that I experienced were wasteful, um, but there are many, many more. I know the school is um, always happy to buy programs and new curriculum, and it seems like by the time the teachers and the kids get used to it, we buy something else. Um, can we please buy things uh, that fall under an umbrella of longevity so we don't have to keep replacing things? The next thing I want to talk about um, is the CTE program, which falls under technology. We've had vocational programs for years. But here's the thing. We all know that technology becomes outdated very quickly. It's also very expensive to maintain. And while we do get some grants and some reimbursement from the state for some of these programs, it doesn't come near close to covering what it costs to run. I would like you to look at some of these programs and maybe the ones that cost a lot or um, you could, could actually um, change and offer other programs that are more cost effective. I know that there's been talk about consolidating programs and that may have to be but I don't want you to eliminate things because honestly, the electives and special subjects are sometimes where kids find their way. They find an interest and a strength. During this problem uh, time of balancing our budget, I know it's a fiscal necessity to, um, to move forward. While balancing the budget, I want you to keep track of what public education is. By definition, the word public means for the good of all people. That would mean all students, not just a certain group, and it would mean the community. So please keep that in mind. As you make decisions for next year's budget, please use fiscal discretion and spend our money with purpose and goals um, to help our students develop skills that will help them in the world to come, not just um, train them for an entry level job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jinger. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we have one minute left of the 30 minute comment period. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Jinger. I signed in. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is actually expenses, actually cost of what happened and what has been happening with the school board. To actually say in the past, we'll go to 2006, and one million was spent for intelligent design. What a waste of money. Why? Because somebody had an idea. 1.2 million was settled for a lawsuit in 2018. Money out the door. In 2020, 2021, I know the school board actually came to the agreement that they could build a new school. The proposed budget was $65 million. There was one dissenting vote that I know of 
by a current school board member. The actual cost of that building came in at $70 million, $5 million more than what it should have been. Why? Because somebody didn't do their homework. To renovate the middle school is what I can understand to be at the, high, the, the current high school or what was the current high school or the middle school, $8 million. Mr. Younger, hold on just a minute. We've, uh, we've run out of our 30 minute period. I'd like to ask the board uh, if there's any objection to allowing him to have two minutes to finish his comments. No, no objection. objection. No objection. Okay, proceed. Okay, thank you. And then, of course, you know, we have the 2021-2022, uh, uh, and from the amount I've gotten, I, or at least I, I can understand, is going to be about $4.3 million loss to Washington Township for the students that could transfer it up there because it, Somebody ended up closing Crawl Town, which I guess was a necessity. When I look at expenses, in general expenses, I have to scratch my head because I can remember back when my kids graduated in 2014 and 2015, they didn't hold the graduation ceremony in the high school, in the actual stadium. One of them was down at York Expo Center. And I'm sure that came at a cost. And then the other one was at the church. I, I don't understand that, why that was done, but it was. When I actually look at multiple purchases for March expenditures, I see a repetition of going to Giant. I see a repetition going to Spangler's. Are those guys giving us a discount? And there's where you lose control on your expenses. When somebody's running down to get something because they didn't plan. So maybe we're getting a discount down there. I don't know. The marquee out front of the middle school looks great. However, nobody's managing it. I went by there the other day and there was something posted for March 20th. What, that, that's senseless. And how much is that thing costing to run? How much is because it's a neon sign, it keeps changing. How much of an expense? So electric usage in general, when we actually have the high school or the uh, elementary school up here has the lights on in the gymnasium and nobody's around. So I, I, don't, I don't understand. So in closing, I just want to say that there needs to start with how much of an increase. Well, yeah, the increase when I, I heard from the last school board meeting, just in general with gas, electric, if we know how much that's going to go up, then you tighten your belt. You, Somebody needs to be accountable. I'm sorry, sir. And not, watching sorry. over what's going on and minding the store. And that's not happening. Don't raise our taxes. All right, that concludes the public comment period. Next is the uh, board president's communication, the announcement of executive sessions. I stated this last week. I'll state it, state it again. We had an executive session for board training held on April the 9th at 6 p.m. lasted for one hour. All right, our next uh, agenda item is the consent agenda for student activity. All of these individual items were covered in our discussion last week. Is there any additional discussion? Is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve item six, consent agenda for student activity. Director McKinney moves. Is there a second? I second. Director Hogan seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine yes. And the motion carries. Next agenda item is a consent agenda for human resources. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, is there a motion to approve?
So move. Okay, Director Emig moves. I'll second. Director Miller seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allen, please call the vote. Nine yes. Nine yes, and the motion carries. Next item on the agenda is Section 8, Contracts and Agreements. Each one of these, because they involve expenditure of funds, we will take up individually. First one is Agenda Item 8.01, Everyday Math Quote. Is there any discussion? Yes, Dr. Howe. Uh, before the board votes on it, I just want to make a correction to a comment that I made last um, month where I had stated that the cost for one year um, would be $91,000. That was incorrect, so I wanted to make that correction. The quote for three years is one thirty nine nine, but for one year it would be $54,000. $58.75. So I wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that before you voted. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Hout. Hang on just a second. Any questions for Dr. Hout? All right. Thank you, Dr. Hout. Any questions from the board or comments? Is there a motion to approve the everyday math quote? I move to approve the everyday math quote, <clears throat> section 8.01. Director Hogan moves. Is there a second? Director Meese, I'll second that. Director Meese seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? I do have some questions, uh, and I didn't realize you excused Dr. Howe that quickly, but you just said uh, 139, the quote that we're looking at right now is 136. Dr. Halk, please come back up. Thanks. <clears throat> the quote you are looking at is the correct one. Sorry, I just said it wrong. So it's 136. Correct. And also, uh, last week I had stated that I'm a little nervous about implementing this for three years. Because for, for me, I, I'm not sure this is a, a good math program. I think there's probably better ones out there. And I know you're up against having to implement a new science curriculum next year. But I also, uh, in discussion with you in the middle of this week, you had said you were talking to some teachers and others. Have we, is there a solution here that we can, can do something rather than implement for three, buy this for three years. The, I did um, poll a number of the teachers, the ones who were willing to provide feedback. Um, they, the, the actual, their opinions of everyday math varied as you expect. Some people absolutely love it and some people didn't. That's what you would expect. Um, when I asked them about looking at a new program, most, almost all of them are very willing to look at another program, but they almost all also told me they have no interest in trying to implement two programs at one time which is exactly what I suspected that they would do. And the purchase of a new program is typically a three-year process. You spend one year investigating it, you spend the second year piloting it, and then you implement it the third year. Um, however, again, we're running into the problem where I, I do not want to ask teachers to pilot a brand new math program at the same time that they are implementing a brand new program. Th that That's my 
professional judgment, um, and it's the recommendation that I am making. Certainly, if the board were to vote no on this three-year contract, then I would have to go to the drawing board and figure out how to pilot a program while implementing a brand new one. The other part of that is then you're also asking teachers to implement a brand new program three years in a row. That's a lot for teachers to, um, to manage. So I'm, I'm trying to protect, protect the fidelity of implementation. It requires a great deal of professional development. You can't just hand teachers a program and say, have at it. Um, you have to do professional development. You have to support them throughout the year. I'm going to be supporting the, um, in the English language arts teachers this year. I will be supporting the science teachers the following year. Um, and so I need those three years. And then in that third year is when we will be prepared to pilot. So that third year is when I would anticipate piloting, the third year of this program. Keep in mind, piloting costs money. Most programs will not give you the materials for free. You have to buy them. So I need to plan for that as well. Any other questions? If I recall, this was just for consumables, correct? We already have the program in place? Yep, we have everything. This is just for the consumables and the digital license so that the teachers can have all of the materials um, online. We had talked about home links as well. We are not going to purchase the home links. Okay. Um, I, there may have been one or two grade levels that still use them, and I will buy them for them, but not for the ones who won't use them. And that's in here? It, it, no, it, so it's probably going to be less than what you're seeing in here because this quote does contain the home links. So I would be removing those, yes. For how many grades? Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. All, most grades do not want the home links. Okay. Which is the homework, right? The home links are there, is their homework assignment. Correct. I think the teachers prefer to develop their own homework assignments. So it's potentially about a $12,000 savings then? Correct. Yeah. I have a question in regards to the teachers that were interested in hoping to see a new program implemented. Uh, would any of those be willing to maybe come together and just maybe offer some suggestions on alternatives to the everyday math program? Like just periodically kind of suggest, you know, using this program or trying this program to the other teachers while they're trying things out to see, you know, just to get some opinions in the, pro like just little, you know, mm -hmm. parts here and there throughout the next couple years so that maybe we have more of a. That would absolutely be part yeah. of the process. Yes, that is not a decision I would make. I, I don't pick the program. I get a committee of teachers together. We look at them. We have teachers piloting. And yeah. so that's how we did collaborative classroom. How many teachers would you say? definitely do not care for the program. I, I don't have an accurate count because not everybody even responded yet. Okay. I'd be interested to know how many of them would be motivated to see if there's enough interest to just look into some things. I definitely think there's interest in looking into the things. That's not our, our challenge. Um, the interest is there. The challenge is the timing. I'm, I'm more or less talking about here within like the next year or two like what maybe supplemental curriculum could be out there to start looking at, like that they could use in their lessons sure. a while to see if it's going to work, you know, because if they're motivated, then they're excited to, to the idea, oh, we could possibly have a better program. I want to see if this might work with my kids. And then they could share with each other if it's working, not working. And then, you know, just kind of like their own experimental research. So we are, uh, we've already started investigating and looking at some programs and asking for free samples. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. So we, we're, we're starting. We're getting started. Yeah. Um, it, it's really about the timing. And for me, one of the biggest factors is the professional development. I don't want to do it poorly. Yeah. If we're going to implement a program, I want to do it right. I want to give teachers the professional development and the support that they need to implement it correctly. I don't feel like I can do that with two programs at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is everyday math still doing professional development, even though they've been using it for a few years, or are they done? They do it? offer some free professional development. So if I remember one of the things you said, if we tried to uh, pilot a program or implement something different in this, that would cost significantly more money, right? Correct. 
Okay. Right, right now, we're only buying the workbooks. I'm going to use the word workbooks because that's the term that most people are familiar with. We call them consumables. The teachers have all of their manuals. They have all of the manipulatives. They already have everything. If we go to a brand new program, we're buying everything from scratch. So we're buying all of the manuals, all of the manipulatives, everything that goes with that program. So it'll absolutely be more than, than what is it, 30 then uh, 40, it's $46,000 a year, 46664 It's going to be way more than that. Yeah, uh, I can also appreciate your um, phasing in of new curriculum rather than trying to, you know, uh, do, a, you know, a complete turnover of curriculum. But uh, in particular for these, how many teachers, because um, in the, in grades four and five, they change classes, right? Right. So how many of those teachers in those grades would still have to learn both, you know, new curriculum programs? Most of them teach math and science. Okay. That's the problem. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I do just, uh, I do want to just remind the board and, and, and the public that um, we were required to purchase a new language arts program because the one that we were using, they aren't making it anymore. So that's why we had to do that. And the science standards are coming from the state of Pennsylvania. That was not a decision that Dover. Dover did not make the decision to add a new language arts program, nor did Dover make the decision to add a science program. That's, that's beyond our control. We can decide whether or not we want a new math program, though. We get to make that decision. And it's, is it your intent that, and of course you're going to, you know, do some thorough research, but probably do away with the everyday math when you do make the decision to phase in the new program? Everyday math would be one of the programs that we consider along with the others to do a fair comparison. Okay, so, so that would still be included. So we haven't, we're not uh, pre-decisional on what we're going to choose down the road. So we may choose this again. Is what you're saying? It's a possibility. I I, it, I don't think that's likely, to be honest with you. But um, I'm certainly willing to continue with everyday math and get some more professional development. But I think there's enough interest in another math program. Um, and I'm hearing from the board that you're interested in looking at another math program as well. So um, that's what we'll do. Okay. Ultimately, you'll get to approve or not approve it, though, of course. Yeah, I'd like to... Um, uh, not necessarily speak against, but to urge caution about the suggestion that the uh, previous speaker made about allowing teachers to phase in. We're dealing with uh, policy, and we'll be voting on it here tonight about uh, you know requiring permission to stray away from uh, plan instruction. So um, I, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea for us to be experimental in the classroom outside of the administration's approval. Yeah, and that wouldn't happen. They would they would do that with our approval and we would be vetting the materials and we're not just going to let a teacher just randomly choose a material and start using it. They would do that with us. Okay. Yes. Right. Any other questions? For Dr. Houck, hey, we don't want her to keep having to jump up and down. All right, thank you, Dr. Houck. You're welcome. All right. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. The next item is agenda item 8.02, the Apple quote, MacBook purchase. Is there any discussion? Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the Apple Quote MacBook Purchase 8.02. Dr. Hogan moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Dr. McKinney seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote.
Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the Millersville University Affiliation Agreement for Nursing Clinical Experience, agenda item 8.03. Is there any discussion? Is there a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve 8.03, Millersville University Agreement. Dr. McKinney moves. Is it our second? I'll second. Dr. Miller uh, seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Next item on the agenda is agenda item 8.04, the Shippensburg University Affiliation Agreement for Student Teachers and Interns. Is there any discussion, questions, or comments? Is there a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve 8.04. Dr. Miller moves. Is there a second? Second. Dr. McKinney seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Next item on the agenda is a section on Finances, agenda item 9.01, uh, bills paid. Is there any discussion, questions, or comments in addition to what we asked last week? Is there a motion to accept the bills paid report? Make a motion to approve 9.01 bills paid. Director McKinney moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Director Meese seconds the motion. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Next item is agenda item 9.02, the treasurer's report. Is there any questions, comments, and concerns in addition to what we asked last week? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the treasurer's report? Make a motion to approve 9.02, treasurer's report. Director McKinney moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Director Meese seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Section 10 is action item section. Uh, agenda item 10.01 is a date change for the June Board of Directors meeting from Tuesday, June 18th, 2024 to Thursday, June 20th, 2024. This change in the date uh, allows the 30-day required period between the approval of the preliminary budget and the adoption of the final budget. Is there any discussion or questions? Is there a motion to approve? I move that we uh, change the date on the meeting. All right, Director McKinney moves. Is there a second? I'm sorry, Director, correction, Director Kendig. Every meeting I'm calling I told it the wrong you every name. meeting. Well, 
<laughs> I'm consistent. Director <laughs> Kendig moves. He gave me the evil eye when I did that too. <laughs> I could feel it on my shoulder. Is there a second? I I'll second. second. Go Dr ahead, take it out. Director Emig seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? I have a question. Director Hogan. Uh, you had mentioned the, the reason for the date change would be to potentially finalize the budget because we need 30 days. Can we do that in May? I mean, if, if we're all in agreement at that time, is it possible that, does it have to be June? I mean, uh, can we do it in May? Are you asking, can we approve the final budget in May? Right. No. Uh, if we'll have to have, uh, first have an approved preliminary budget. That must be out before the public for 30 days before we can. Uh, so we would have to do that budget. tonight if that were the case, right? Right. Okay. Right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman. Director Meese, did you cast your vote? I thought so. Sorry. There we go. Nine yes. And the motion carries. Agenda item 10.02, curriculum uh, request for adoption or approval. I'm sorry, uh, request for approval from the administration. English 3 KUDs and English 4 KUDs. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve 10.02, the curriculum. Director Miller moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Director Whitmer seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion is adopted. Agenda item 10.03, policies. We have two policies. Uh, the first one is a, uh, policy number 105.2, uh, exemption from instruction. Uh, there's two statements that have been changed in this policy. It's been available for now a week and a half online. This. Um, adds a statement that um, written requests for exemption from instruction should be made five school days in advance of a particular lesson with some additional language in there. Is there any discussion, comments, questions? All right, uh, policy number 106 is the guidelines for planned instruction. This is the one that uh, I referenced earlier in my uh, comments to uh, Dr. Halk, is each teaching staff member shall conduct the assigned planned instruction in accordance with the guide and any deviation from its content must be approved in advance by the superintendent or designee. There's some additional language change in there, but it's de minimis. Um, is there any discussion or comments or questions concerning that policy change? Director Kendig. Thank you. On policy uh, 106, I'd question the uh, use of S uh, slash he. During this week, I went back and did a search on our policies, uh, putting that in, see if there's other policies in, in the district that have that. When I got to number four uh, policy that has it in there, I stopped searching. Uh, so even though I'm not real happy with that language, we have other policies that contain it. 
So I can reluctantly uh, agree to this policy. Thank you, Director Kendi. Any other questions, comments? All right, is there a motion to approve the two policy changes? I'll make a motion to approve 10.03 policies. Director McKinney moves. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. I'm sorry. Director Hogan seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Agenda item 10.04, obsolete listing from the Department of Exceptional Children. There is a list of the equipment attached. Is there, are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Is there a motion to approve the obsolete listing? I move to approve the obsolete listing list, uh, section 10.04. Director Hogan moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Director Miller seconds a motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the motion carries. Next agenda item is 10.05. Requesting approval of the minutes of the March 12th board planning meeting. Since it is a planning meeting, we will not take the time to read those minutes. Are there any questions, comments, or corrections to the minutes? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the March 12th board planning meeting? I make motion we <clears throat> approve the March 12th board meet planning meeting minutes. Director Kendig moves. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Whitmer seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allman, please call the vote. Nine, yes. And the minutes are adopted. Agenda item 10.06, our request for approval of the minutes of the March 19th, 2024 board meeting where action was taken. Mrs. Allman, are you prepared to read the minutes? I can pull those up and read it if yes. the board chooses. Yes, please. I'd like to make a motion that everybody gets a copy of that. It's on the web page. I don't see a reason why we need to read that in public. So, uh, Director Emig, are you moving to dispense yes, with making, the reading? Yes, I make a motion to spam reading these minutes. I second. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, uh, Director Emig moves to dispense with the reading of the minutes and is seconded by Director Wolverton. Is there any discussion? All right, uh, is there any opposition to uh, dispensing with the reading? Hearing none, that motion is approved by acclamation. So is there a motion to approve the March 19, 2024 board meeting minutes? I make that motion. Director Emig moves to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Director Hogan seconds the motion. Is there any further discussions or corrections to the minutes? Mary and Mrs. Allman, please call the vote.
Nine yes. And the minutes are adopted. This brings us to our uh, discussion item, section 11, item 11.01, the 2024-2025 budget discussion. Attached to that uh, agenda item are the present budget presentations that we received in each of the preceding months for January, February, March, and the month of April. So open the floor for discussion. So I'd like to get started. Um, I'd like to reply to all the people who have sent emails and to those who have spoken publicly, to the teachers who go above and beyond every day. I recognize you. To the parent teacher who spoke up at a prior board meeting uh, regarding their children who uh, missed recess to play a musical instrument. I hear you. To the administrators who spend much of their time behind the scenes working tirelessly to solve problems for the school district. I see you. To the students who are concerned about how you love for music, how your love for music and quality of life may be impacted by decisions made by the board, I also hear you. To the families who are struggling to make ends meet and don't want to see another tax increase, I'm accountable to you. To prior board members, you have my commitment to never blame you for our current situation. The current issues we face today are our problems to solve. You are my friends, you are my neighbors. Our kids did not ask us to put them in awkward situations at school because of our decision to be on the board. And I'm mindful of that. To Dennis show, thank you for putting your trust in me with your vote of confidence. Our kids played soccer together during their school days. To Amy Britton, Thank you for the countless mornings you took my son to school and for believing in the responsibility of my daughter to take care of your pets while you were away. You are a great neighbor. To the current board members, let's bring about a positive change to our community. I know we have it within ourselves to achieve this outcome. For this year's budget, we can avoid a tax increase and avoid disruption to the teachers in our district. We have more than enough money to cover our current expenses by utilizing the fund balance. We cannot expect an improvement in student academics if our teachers are concerned about their jobs and students cannot achieve better results in the classroom if there are 25 plus students per teacher. Eliminating more positions, which is on the agenda today, is not the solution. My position is not to eliminate staff from the latest directives. A famous educator once said, every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. And our champions are our teachers. And I just wanted to add that before we get started to just add some context to uh, what we're about to talk about. Thank you, Director Hogan, well-spoken. Anyone else? We do read the um, emails that are sent to us. Um, I know I personally may not respond, but um, please know that they are read um, very carefully. They're very detailed, so we they are being read. Well, in our um, one of our previous meetings, um, there was a tact that was used by one of our directors that uh, seemed quite effective in, in kind of wrangling us. Uh, from, you know, entertaining a, a wide variety of options uh, to gaining some focus to would allow the administration to uh, thoroughly and adequately prepare a preliminary budget for us, which we will need. If we can't come to some terms on what we're looking for and express them to the administration, um, it's a shot in the dark on what we would walk into here next month with uh, in terms of uh, trying to create at the last minute a, a preliminary budget for our approval. So I've looked at the presentations again and uh, noted the, the cuts and the, the amount of financial discipline that this current administration has brought to the school district and I want to applaud them for what they're doing. Uh, losing 
four million dollars worth of revenue uh, per year because of the loss of a, an entire township, and adapting to that uh, and making those types of changes was not a, was not an easy thing to do. Uh, but yet, our school is still delivering a, a, a first-rate education to our students and lots and lots of opportunities. Uh, in our past discussions, we've asked uh, many, many questions, probably to the to the point of of saturation in some cases of information this administration has been extremely responsive uh, and thorough in their uh, not just answers to questions about finances but but detailed answers about why we are doing and conducting the activities that, that we're engaged in so i appreciate what the administration is doing i also appreciate the leadership that's coming from our superintendent and our assistant superintendent and from our CFOO and our director of human resources. Um, I don't think I've ever been in um, uh, more open briefings uh, than I have been with our director of human resources. She is very forthright and it's very easy to understand and very uh, easy to follow and I appreciate that. But back to our budget discussions for tonight. Um, I am willing to accept the reductions to the spending increase that the administration has made. And in addition, the three directives that we were provided last week, um, Directive 1, I'm willing to accept every one of those um, suggestions that are in Directive 1. And I'm willing also to accept uh, the reduction number 2 in Directive number two, which is the elimination of a part-time administration receptionist. I think that with the amount of um, reductions that we've already made, we don't want to reduce, you know, teacher staffing in the sixth grade. I don't think we want to eliminate um, our options for the use of River Rock, I think that's, um, you know, we're asking the administration to handle these things appropriately and we want to take away those type of options from them. We don't want to limit the ability of the band to, to uh, travel with the teams. Um, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the board when I say we, I'm, I'm saying that I don't think that we need to do that. And uh, the options that are in, in directive number three, I think they, they cut, um, I think, far too much. Uh, the one in particular that stands out that I'd be strongly opposed to would be cutting junior high sports. Uh, there are, if, if other board members have some support of some of these items, uh, there are three that I would entertain conversations of. I'm not saying that I would support them necessarily, but I would entertain the conversations on them, which is uh, the elimination of the computer technician. I would have, you know, certainly a lot of questions about that. The recommendation to eliminate the CTE uh, uh, commercial advertising art teacher. I would have lots of questions about that as well, but I would certainly entertain those discussions. And the elimination of the music teacher uh, would be the least desirable, the ones I'd be willing to talk about, but I have lots of questions on that as well. Uh, so I, I throw these out there, and just in summary, the, the, all of them in Directive 5 and, and the second one in Directive 2, the ones that I, I support in accepting the administration's reductions. So I open it up uh, for further discussion from the rest of the board members. Mr. Uh, Pratt. When do you foresee us having to pay Northern School District if we do that $3 million? You're more than likely looking at a couple of years from now because of the fact that the first um, this appeal that's going on right now, that's in the Commonwealth Court, that's going to take some time, briefing, argument, and decision. And then more than likely, um, Depending on the Commonwealth, I mean the Commonwealth Court's decision, you're looking at a possible appeal to the Supreme Court, which would be years down the road as well, too. Okay. What I'm getting at, everyone, is the idea of us keeping that three million dollars in our fund budget, of course, and drawing interest off of it. 
What I'm concerned about in uh, what you propose, Mr. Hogan, is simply the idea of, hey, we just take the money out of the fund and pay for everything. Once that money is gone, it's gone. And you're talking $2.4 million. I would recommend that we kind of establish a program when I talk again, as Mrs. Meese and I like the idea of a three to five year program of withdrawing no more than one, like say $1.5 million out of that fund budget any year. Based on the mere fact, it's just a good planning process. We know exactly what we're allowed to, we give ourselves to take and we go from there, whether it be with cuts or whatever at that time. That's just my recommendation. I would not start reducing that fund budget by large amounts. And right now you're talking two and a half million dollars, basically two and 2.4. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that at any time. I think the fund balance reduction would cost us 1.8. If we took the directive one, plus the 400,000 in the access funds. Um, I was along the same thought process you were at the beginning when I started. I, I thought the, uh, the interest we were making on that money was excellent and it would pay for teachers year after year, so why touch it? But the point that someone made to me was, um, we can't treat it like a business where um, that money is being used to gain interest. So that's changed my mindset on that. Well, I won't argue with you, but having worked for the government for 35 years, it basically as a business, this is a government entity and it has its budget and we need to protect it where we can. I'll ask this question, you know, how many of you sat in that middle school when they proposed building that new school? How many of you actually sat there? And they refused to answer any of the questions that the general public, that's why these taxpayers are in here. They've been ignored in the past. They're tired of tax increases. And if we can hold it and limit it for years to go, and as we've discussed in here before, as the population of this township increases and the tax revenue increases, it will all balance out. I had a really good uh, conversation today with an individual who lives in the township. He's an engineer. He's the vice president of a company. He has two kids up at uh, Penn State. Long story short, his idea of it was make the cuts now initially, do what you have to do. And then as we get the tax revenue built back into the system, we bring back any programs that may have had to be eliminated. And he said, you know, it's sometimes you just got to, you know, pay the piper on what you, what's been going on over the years. And that's what's taking place in this school district. You know, it's, again, it's no fault of the people sitting on this board. But the bottom line is you can't keep going to the taxpayer, you know. So if we have to make some minor cuts, make them every year for two, three, four years, and then bring back whatever programs you, you initially taken out as the tax revenue increases. That's my proposal to it. And that's why I say limit the amount taken out of the general fund to like 1.5 million per year, because if you, if you do it two or three, four years, or, you know, it'll be gone in no time. Anybody else has anything? I think um, we're in this situation didn't happen overnight. Um, you know, the Washington Township situation has been going on for a decade. So here it is. So we're not going to solve the problem overnight. And I think <clears throat> um, we have to keep in mind there's not, how do you associate a dollar value with the morale in our district? So we have to be very careful that we don't cut like or or eliminate a lot at once you know um because it, it's a fine line you know so i'm with alan in using the um the fund balance for that reason because it is you know it's our kids it's our teachers it's our admin and it's not a business in that sense you know, it's a community. So we have to be careful that, that we don't 
upset people and, and impact the morale, you know, of our community. So, but I under, I don't want to increase taxes either. And that's so I think, you know, to your point and the gentleman that you spoke to, I get that. And that's easy to do in a business. Um, not easy really, but easier. Um, and, and, you know, we have how many employees of the district? 400. It's a lot, a lot of people just speaking from the employee standpoint. So just keeping their interests at heart. So I, like President Conley, I went through each directive line by line to see which ones were acceptable or more desirable than the others. Uh, down on board directive three, honestly, there's nothing there I'd accept. Um, cutting out sports, the teachers ones, we uh, we could talk about them like Director Conley said. Uh, the additional facility equipment, repairs, maintenance, if we cut that down too far, it's it's gonna bite us. We can't we can't totally neglect the, the building systems. Sub so directive board directive two, the ones I would not accept, cutting sixth grade teachers, cutting music teacher. River Rock, I think we have some situations right now where we need to keep that in place for student safety. Um, the receptionist, I, I think I could add that up to the, uh, the cuts in Board Directive 1. I think all of those are doable without a lot of pain. Um, so my suggestion would be to go along with board directive number one. We could talk about adding that receptionist position up in there. The one that is really minimal is the athletic live streaming, $12,000. If it was just live streaming, I'd say go ahead and cut it and find us like a student run solution. but. Dr. Wiesling was in earlier in the uh, the board planning meeting and said there's a lot of analytical advantage to using that for our athletic teams. So just like we want to keep our um, academic performance high, we also don't want to put our athletes at a disadvantage. So if you know, that could be one thing possibly to pull out of there, but I could live if we have to cut it. That's that's good, but that's my recommendation. Board Directive One, possibly adding the receptionists. That brings us to about four hundred and seventy thousand dollars in reductions, along with the administration's recommendations, and no tax increase. To me, that's that's our solution. Anyone else agree? Yes, I agree. I agree to that. Um, with the live streaming, there was a point made on one slide that <clears throat> with live streaming, we, we lose out on um, spectator funds because people don't come, you know, so it's possible. There's that to consider, if we, yeah. you know, if we keep that in. Yeah. But I see I your it's point. A good perk like, I for, your it's point. a good perk for parents who work and can't make sure. it to the event. That's yeah. probably the majority of the hits, I would yeah. think. And people that live out of town, grandparents and stuff, yeah. it's nice for them to be able to watch. Um, we batted around a subscription, possibly, because yeah. they do have an all sports pass for gate admissions, I believe, for the entire year. It's so maybe a, a plan like that could be work, but that would still be a minimal, minimal amount of revenue. I don't think it would totally cover it. What, whatever we do choose, I do want to continue the conversation on what it's going to look like next year and the next year and the next year. You know, so once we get over this hurdle, how are we going to, how are we going to revisit this next year? So we don't have this as much contention. Like everybody's already aware of where we're at. You know, we keep educating ourselves and, and the public. And there was somebody that spoke um, about um, going to the teachers union to see if they're willing to to help at all. I mean, it's worth it, it's worth having that conversation, I think. So just keeping our eyes and ears open to those. Um, Director Whitmore shared a link to possible revenue increases as well, that we can just, we don't shut the door. We continue to work 
on this and, and look for possible revenues that we don't have to, and whatever revenues we can get over the next school year, we can, we don't have to pull from the fund balance then, so. Yeah, um, for the, uh, I just wanna add about the live stream. So um, the, the live stream is a, is a community service to some degree where um, you're gonna be able to watch your kids play, your grandparents who might live in another state, they can watch their kids play. Um, the football program really is dependent on this. They don't have any other film uh, that I'm aware of that they use for strategy. Um, this uh, is important to the football program and in, in in the way that they, they play their games. And, and not only that, it's, it is exchanged with all our sports teams, basketball, lacrosse. Um, I forget how many teams use it, but there's quite a few. Um, but when they go to another school and if they're using the huddle software, there's an exchange there where they would receive back uh, the film of that game so they can use that in their instruction process. The analytics that I found out was uh, pretty detailed where it could say that um, like player 12 pass the ball to player 10 this many times in a game. It goes to that extent. Um, the one thing that I really liked about uh, th this software is that our students who are going to higher education and they're looking for a scholarship, they can use the live stream as a highlight reel. And we'll take that away from them, uh, presenting that to their school that they, that they want to attend. So there's a lot of reasons I feel like the $12,000 would be worth uh, investing into our community to keep this. And yeah, that's why I suggested maybe pulling that out because the cost is so minimal and we don't want to put our athletes, student athletes at a disadvantage. So I was thinking of swapping that one out with that receptionist position. We're still at 455,000 in reductions. So that brings the Fund balance drawdown is still a little higher than I'd like at 1.8, but as Director Meese said, it's going to be tough to fix that in one year. So that plan with the no tax increase is the route that I I would vote for. I did want to add, I took a note, <laughs> the uh, home links. So what I don't understand is uh, I think that amount is something that's in our it's in our budget, and if that home links is going away, that was a twelve thousand dollars savings. So maybe we could look at it as a wash to keep live stream since home home links is going away, and that's already an amount that's we've approved. I don't know if that it is math works or not. It is twelve thousand saved. Yeah. Yeah, there were some um, good suggestions from the public over the last few meetings. Uh, Ms. Whitmer tonight with the union uh, options. I don't know if we have time to look into those for this budget, but I did like those. Um, there was another one. I can't recall the other one. At a past board meeting, there was also a example of Spring Grove, how they do something for seniors with real estate taxes, so the rebate program that might be worth looking into in the future also. But I think if we can uh, maybe pad our plan here with a few of those options, that's even <clears throat> even more improvement. Any other discussion? Oh, the other, uh, the one that slipped my mind was the uh, the voluntary additional tax paid. Some people might go for it. It's just added money. I personally don't have that in my budget, but some people who are passionate about contributing to the school district, they may. Do we even know if that's possible? I don't know. We probably talked to tax collector Keener, I would think. Does anyone in here know if that's possible? Is that legal, Mr. Pratt? I have no idea. 
Yeah. No one has Why don't ever we ask the tax me. lady yeah. since she's she here? She's right. sitting right there. Right. Just, okay. There we go. Oh, no one has ever asked, can I pay more in taxes to yeah, me? They've that, only asked, can I pay often. less in taxes? So this is news to me, and I'd love to hear the answer. Or would that be a nightmare for the tax collector? <laughs> In 25 years, I have had a few people pay other people's taxes directly. I don't see how you could just, here's a thousand bucks, whoever you want to give it to, no, no, that can't go. Um, but I have had people pay other people's taxes the correct amount. I can't have extra money in my office. <laughs> There's, no, there's your problem. So we the way it, that she accounts for it is going to be the issue. Yeah. And then the distribution to the school is going to be the issue. So, and I don't so want to call be it a trouble. capital campaign. Take donations. <laughs> but anybody that wants to pay somebody else's taxes, feel free. Right. Sure. I mean, I have had two or three over 25 years, but they knew the person or they knew they were in dire straits and they helped them. They paid it, mm -hmm. but they paid the bill directly. I can't have extra money. Okay out here sitting, I, I no, <laughs> that, it was not, a fun that's, idea. Old, that's not going to work. Mrs. Keener, just for the record, would you state your position in, in the county? I'm Dover Township tax collector. There you go. All right. Thank you. I just collect let, tax, the, let the public know. I collect taxes for York County, Dover Township, and Dover School District. Any other questions since I'm here? <laughs> You want the budget approved in May, don't you? I'm done with that. <laughs> you guys do whatever. I'll do my job. We'll get them out. They might be late, but we'll get them out. It'll get done. It always has. It will. Any questions? Oh. You're saying even if there was a part, like I think Mrs. Myers suggested having like a, a specific box that they could check and say, well, I'm giving this amount, that wouldn't work. I have never, ever heard of that in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Other states, I don't know. I just know Pennsylvania because we get together as a group um, once a year. I don't see how that would work. Could they just pay at the penalty level? <laughs> <laughs> Again, she has, to, she has yeah, to be able I have to account, account for everything. I have to come <laughs> out to zero with Miranda. Exactly. <laughs> I have to I come understand. to zero. I mean, if they're paying penalty, and it's discount, I send it back and say, hey, we're still in discount, this is what's due. I send it back if they're not if they're not paying the exact amount. It goes back to them to correct it. Yeah, if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. I did like the suggestion. I don't foresee, it is a, a, lot, I don't yeah. see, foresee a lot of people volunteering to do that, but it, it was a good Yeah, it was a good, it was a good thought. Yeah. <laughs> now that I have your attention. Um, I pay mine. <laughs> Um, yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> there was something that came across my desk okay. back in January, and they wanted me to elevate it to the township. So I did send it on over to Laurel, the township manager. And it was, I think it came from ARP. And it's about seniors volunteering and then getting credit off their taxes. I don't know if that's a program that you can, I'm not sure what you guys were talking about with Spring Grove. But there's seniors out there that would love to volunteer and get some credit off their taxes. I have no idea how it works, but that did come across my desk in January. A senior sent it, and she wanted to know what we'd do, and I said, I'll pass it along, and I've heard nothing. But, I mean, maybe that would take some position that you're paying for. I don't know, cafeteria duty, I, I don't know. I don't want to get in, but you know, there's seniors that are wanting to volunteer and give them a little bit of credit on their taxes. Idea. Any, any additional questions for Mrs. Keener? So it would be the township supervisor that we would discuss that with. Is, is she, is the, so it's the township that would be making? No, I don't think you would need no. their permission for anything. You no, guys are would, your own yeah. board. Okay. We, other school districts have done this. You create a resolution, um, and it would be a requirement that the seniors would have to um, provide volunteer services to the school district, and in lieu of those services, you reduce their tax 
op, um, responsibility. Terry, didn't we do something like this years ago? Years ago, because you're the oldest one up. I mean, not the oldest, <laughs> but the long. I feel like something years ago, we had a few taxpayers that did something. I can't remember. We did. We did. It just nobody else wanted it yet, which is why we haven't done it in a long time. I thought there was some. Okay. Because obviously, if you reduce the amount someone's paying, you're reducing the amount that you're receiving. So you have to understand. Yeah, we that would as have well. to. It, there would have to be a cost savings to offset it. it. There can't be a cost savings. We cannot take work away from the union. Yeah, there's no cost savings that you. The cost savings is to yeah. the taxpayer for volunteering or assisting in the school district. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions for Mrs. Keener? Thank you, Mrs. Keener. Thank Appreciate you. the answers. All right, we're back to our budget discussion. We've had, um, I expressed my thoughts on the directives, and we've had two other directors express their thoughts. Anyone else? I would like to uh, talk about. I understand we don't want to, or at least it was mentioned, maybe we don't take too much out of the cash reserve or whatever we call that fund. Um, in running, running the numbers that I ran, looking at the things I looked at, one, the other month the administration had proposed that we take 750,000 out of the access fund. Uh, I've noticed the last couple uh, presentations does not include that. It, it's uh, 400,000 and then another, then another 150. But in the presentation where that was proposed, that brought the access fund balance down to 800,000, which I think is still <clears throat> pretty good. <clears throat> so in my calculations, I I considered taking the 750 uh, out of the access fund. Even doing that, I'm struggling to get below uh, two million coming out of the cash reserve. Now I'm probably a little more conservative on some of these um, reductions that we talked about tonight. So that's where I came out. I came out right just over two, two million coming out of the cash reserve. I keep on thinking about the basic education funding that the state will eventually tell us how much that's going to be. <clears throat> uh, the administration used a 2% increase on that, which I understand the reasoning behind that. Better to be conservative than to tell us it's going to be 6% and then we find out it's only 2%. But every 1% that that goes up, it would be roughly $134,000 more coming in from the state. If you look at the governor's budget that's proposed right now, uh, they're projecting that the increase in basic education funding would be 11%. Now, I know that's pie in the sky, but I would think realistically, hopefully maybe we could get 4%. If we did, that'd be another 260,000 that would help reduce what we have to take out of the uh, reserve fund. So I'm more or less in agreement with uh, Director Conley and some others who said uh, board direct, directive one, um, I'm on the fence with this uh, supply budget and athletic live, live streaming and that. Um, I know years ago they didn't have live streaming. With, it was implemented because of COVID. I think there are parents, taxpayers who have gotten used to being able to possibly see athletic events or whatever, they can't get there because of work or whatever, and they're still able to see it. So I'm a little sensitive to that. Um, 
I am in agreement with, I think, the part-time administrative receptionist position could be eliminated. So I, where I'm at right now is I'm coming in just over $2 million out of the cash reserve and $750,000 out of the access funds. And uh, what we have to keep in mind is when we look at the, the top section of what the administration proposed, they proposed a 2% millage increase, which is just shy of 600,000. So if we take that 600,000 out, we got to make it up somewhere else. So I'm, I'm just not comfortable that we'll ever be able to get that cash that will get down to 1.5 million out of the cash reserve and be able to balance this budget. Thank you, Director Kindig. I'd like to recognize uh, our CFOO, Mrs. Weaver. Uh, could you speak to some of the things that he talked about, in particular the the uh, access funding? Yeah, actually, right now with administration's recommendation, it's nine hundred thousand. So nine hundred thousand will be taken out of the one point almost one point three million. That's what's currently in administration's recommendations. Plus option one. Is that in the presentation? Yes, it's in every presentation. All the slow movement, the slow movement up the scale of usage is in all of the presentations. So the in directive one, the access funding drawdown that says 150 adds to what was already 750. That is correct, which was an administration's recommendation. Okay, because mm -hmm. okay, I'm I, I'm looking at what was given to the public last week, and you had sent it to us as board members, <clears throat> and at the very top it talks about administration's recommendation, increased utilization of access funds. It says four hundred thousand. But I see. We already had three hundred fifty thousand in the budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, that's, what that's where I'm getting. Yeah. Okay. It's confused. just not a itemized hand. Yeah. So you're proposing 900,000. That's what you're saying. Well, I, well, administration didn't propose 900,000, but in order to get directive one from the board to accurately work, we had to add in $150,000 because we're trying to touch things and not people and student education. Uh, and the other thing with regards to basic ed, we will not get more than the 2% unless the inadequacy formula is funded, which is currently in the governor's budget. That will add $1.26 million additional, which means you wouldn't have to use the fund balance entirely as the board would approve it if that money would come through. Okay. On the um, fund balance drawdown, when he mentioned having difficulty um, getting below two million dollars on the fund balance withdrawal, I saw you lean up to the mic, and that's when I, you know, let you know that I would recognize you to speak to that. Can you speak to that too? What would be our, if we took accepted Directive One, what would be our fund balance drawdown for sure? Uh, I, I want to say I think it's maybe it's whatever the first directive was. If you go back to it, I don't. I, I can look at. It. I don't have my folder with me, but. But it should be on the slide. Yeah, I think it says uh, usage of two million. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. just about. So that's that is you know to be clear that's what we're looking at is two million dollar drawdown on it then. So with that being the case, um, that's why I put question marks on mine that I would want to have additional, you know, if we're uncomfortable with that amount, have additional conversation on those three items that I talked about. And this is also why I included the uh, elimination of the part-time administrative receptionist in my original 
endorsement, I guess you could say. Any other comments from any other board members? But we don't we don't have a majority of the board speaking yet. So we have what I've tried to capture. We have three board members who have made known what they would like to see. Is any other board members? Because we've got to tell the administration they they're not going to be able to build something unless we tell them what we want. So I'll go ahead and speak. I, I feel like I already have, but um, I'm not for. I'm I'm I'm. Uh, I want to keep our band and cheer transportation and our our music teacher and our second uh, two sixth grade teachers, all administrative staff. River Rock's important, keeping that. I don't see any elimination. The uh, administrative receptionist, I feel like we need to keep that because administrators have a job to do. And if they're going to the window to answer the door, that distraction puts them back wherever their thought process was while they were working. So I think that's the the difference there it's not worth eliminating a position to keep our administrators from doing what they need to be doing so my suggestion is we keep everything in directives two and three okay so you're supporting accepting directive one i am i would like to talk about the live stream and try to carve that out okay so that's a caveat there I would like to go with the directive one. I'm not so sure about the live streaming, um, but you had a good point with the everyday math. Maybe that's going to balance out. Um, I'd like to know, do all the sports use that live streaming? Um, I can answer that. Many. Not all sports. Um, the ones on the lacrosse field, uh, the one at the track, uh, the one in the gym, there are some that are excluded. But uh, the one, there's the majority of the sports, I believe, use it. And you're referring to the huddle, correct? The huddle program, okay. yes. I'm, I'm not familiar with that, so I, that's why I'm not sure about the athletics live streaming. But I, when you mentioned the college, I know that that's important to um, getting those scholarships. Um, I cannot go with anything in, in Directive 2 or 3 other than that administrative receptionist I feel like that's kind of being done right now. Um, I know I, I'm not sure, but I think that people are filling in as it is now. I know that's not easy, um, and I'm not sure if like work can be continued because I'm not sure how much is how many um, times people are coming in to the administrative office. I really don't know, but I would say um, that would be something that I could I could take. Um, are we comfortable with the access going at that access fund going to that rate? I, I don't understand that whole access funding. So that's nine hundred thousand dollars, you said, and that's that's you're comfortable with that. In order to make it work, in order to make the directives work that the board has given us, yes. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm for directive one and the administration receptionist. Um, I really hate to go into million fund balance. I'm just hoping that we can look down the line for the future and, and not have to do that again. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Thank you, Director Milton. Anyone else? And I can comment. So I'm pretty much in agreement there on the directive in which um, one seems something we could live with for now. I I do have some concerns about some of the cuts that um, I'm hoping that later on, if things start looking up, that we could come back around and maybe consider putting them back in, such as the flutter nurse and some other things. The live streaming um, sounds like if coaches and families really are utilizing that, maybe the subscription end of that would work best for us for now, and then we can maybe revisit that. Um, <clears throat> the administrative receptionist, I, um, I'd be fine with that as long as I knew that there wasn't going to be a, 
um, significant hardships in any of the offices. And like I said, if we could maybe revisit it if it does get, you know, really tough and the bill and the building budgets and whatnot are looking good. So the only thing that I have some quick questions about um, in regards to the 10% reduction in building and department supply budgets. Um, I noticed there wasn't, and this is kind of going backwards, Mrs. Weaver, but there there wasn't anything listed for business affairs and transportation curriculum. And there was a mention of busing last at the planning meeting last week. Did we check into the transportation to find out if there were any possibilities of consolidating buses? That was done uh, when the, with the Washington Township loss. So uh, we're still working on looking at it, but I, I, as far as I know, the way we're the way it's being done by e &B is being done very well. Okay. And if, if it's possible, um, I think Mr. Perkins might be working the booth um, to keep uh, Mrs. Weaver's mic hot f for right now while we exchange conversation back with us. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. So, Directors Wolverton and Emig, can we hear from? All right, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I thought about this. The only resolution I have for this budget is using fund balance altogether. That's my answer. Now you heard from me. Okay. <clears throat> what what level of fund balance are you willing the to go? The whole amount. What we're short. And not make any cuts. Right. So I don't want to see any cuts at all. Okay. Keep the just use the fund balance. We have a more than uh, adequate supply in that fund balance, so I can't see doing any cuts at all. Okay, thank you. Dr. Wolverton. Oh, I expressed mine earlier. I'm looking at a 1.5 to basically year after year out of the fund balance. It needs to get established. And if we can bring stuff back in, if we find out we get from the governor's office, the tax revenue increases, that, then we can bring programs back, that type of activity. That's the only way you're going to straighten this budget issue in, in a district that has one township. Yeah. So are you in support of the number reduction, two. reductions in number, number directive one? Well, yes, and number two. And number two. Okay, um, so I've been trying to tabulate this. I'm sure the administration has been trying to do it also, but uh, I think we have a majority of directors express support for accepting the administration's recommendations in number one, directive number one, and also a majority in accepting the one item in directive number two, directive number two which is the elimination of the part-time administrative assistant. There was three directors that, uh, well, two directors, as I remember, please correct me, that I recall said that they are not in favor of reducing the live streaming, and one director express um, keeping it but uh, making up the revenue with subscriptions, I think it was uh, the recommendation. It seemed like a few more than I, I believe it was about four. Total. Was it Eric, I may Dylan, have... myself, Carmen. Heidi. Pardon me for using first names. No. Okay. Is that that's eliminating the live stream. eliminating I'm sorry. Eliminating the live stream is in the recommendation one, correct? It is in there now. Yeah, so so um, there was two two directors. I would keep it I recognize the importance of it. I, I do, but um I can't balance eliminating a floater nurse and keeping live stream. Like I, you know, I can't come to grips with that. So um, we can bring it back in, I think, but it's, I'm not eliminating it because I, I don't value it, you know, but I think it's not a priority. So I, I had 
and please speak up. I had two directors. There were Director Hogan, Director McKinney, that said that uh, they did not want to eliminate the live streaming, so they want to carve that out of that recommendation in Directive 1. Was there others? I, well, I'm sorry. We had um, Director Emig. I didn't record his. He is against all of these, so um, he would also be included in that. <clears throat> So that would be three directors and then one possibly if we could make up the revenue that would be in favor of carving that out. It doesn't sound like a majority yet to me on that. So um, for the administration purposes, uh, does that give you enough to build the no. preliminary budget? No, we need, we, need, we need board directive as to what is going to be majority vote. I think I know. Okay, we do, okay, I just want to make sure. Directive I one. Okay. Swap live streaming. St streaming. I haven't slept much in the last 24 hours. For Homelink. Directive one, swap live streaming for Homelink. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. That's, that's what awesome. you're looking for? I'm good then. If that we can get majority I, vote, that's all we need. Mind. That will be the recommendation we bring forward in May. The presentation will be one slide. Now we we also had six directors that said also add to that the elimination of the part-time administrative receptionist. Is that the vote of the board of a whole? Well, there's no motion, so this is basically taking input. It won't be voted on until we actually have a preliminary budget. Two slides. What's that? Two slides. Two slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. What's on the second slide? Um, eliminating the part-time reception. No? Well, um, what I'm saying is six, a majority have expressed that they would uh, entertain uh, and support if that elimination of the part-time administrative receptionist was included in the preliminary budget. Okay. All right. We so. can add that to one slide. Okay. It'll reduce the fund balance usage a tiny bit. Right. Mm -hmm. 30, 33,000. Okay, so I think that's what the administration needs from us. Is there any uh, further needs that the administration needs from us concerning uh, planning for the preliminary budget? We're good. Okay, very good. Is there any other comments concerning budget before we leave this discussion? I just wanted to ask in regards to the comment made earlier by Mrs. Whitmer and um, the half day pay through the union. Are we going to look into that, Dr. Carwright, or do you think that's for next year? The superintendent does not negotiate with the union. The board does. So that would be the board's oh, initiative. Oh, it's a negotiation. Okay. For purposes of our timelines, that would take some time to negotiate, and you don't, you can't predetermine sure. the outcome. Right. So um, I think it's... It's certainly an interesting option to explore. I wouldn't want to be pre-decisional on that whatsoever. All right. So is any anything else that anyone wants to talk about related to the budget? Yeah, we'll just need to ensure also in the uh, preliminary budget that the tax increase is pulled out, correct? To, yes, to, that's, that's included in this. Okay. Yeah, no tax just increase. Want to, that reminder out there. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, that's uh, a big step forward, I think, for the board. Um, it's not the outcome I think a lot of people are looking for, but we will hear from the public uh, again next month. Uh, we have one additional public comment session in this meeting, I believe. Yes, we do. So we may actually hear some comments related to that tonight. All right. So, without objection, I'll move on to the next agenda item. Hearing none, agenda item 12.01, Dover Eagle Foundation report, Director McKinney. Okay, well, uh, I did a, actually, Alan, you attended the last meeting, correct? I attended a previous one. Yes, I attended the last meeting. Yeah, we Hope. take turns on that. Um, uh, so basically, Mr. Jacobs pretty much covered everything tonight from 
what I heard at the last meeting, we went over the uh, Veterans Memorial and their extensive fundraising. They have a lot of good ideas. So that's that was pretty much the uh, bulk of that meeting. Excellent. Yeah, and just the, the, the May uh, baseball game at the York Revolution, I think there's a website out there. You can buy the tickets. That's a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. There's yep. some other fundraisers in the, uh, in the stream, but they haven't been finalized. And uh, either Rob or I, or Dr. Director McKinney or I will uh, bring that to the board. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would recognize Director Emig for the York Adams Academy report. Currently, Dover has 12 seats at that facility. We have currently nine enrolled students. Three are open seats, and our next meeting will be in two weeks on April the 30th. Hey, thank you. Uh, next report is uh, on the York uh, School of Technology. Uh, is this the JOC report or the... It's both, it's both, both of them together. So. Um, I'll go first with the uh, activity of the last board meeting on the 28th of March. Uh, York County School of Technology is in negotiation with their teachers union. They're getting very close to finalizing an agreement. Uh, in the last meeting, we approved hiring of a full-time school counselor with a focus on mental health. Also approved the hiring of a special ed teacher and an automotive technology teacher. Uh, Ms. Jessica Martin will be the Dean of Summer School this year. We also approved several new assistant coaches, three of them as a matter of fact, and we approved the adult education catalog for the 2024-2025 uh, school year. Also adopted the new comprehensive plan for the school, which is uh, very aggressive, and uh, adopted the uh, treasurer's report with expenditures of 5.4 million for the end of February. All right. Mr. I'm sorry, Director McKin uh, Kindig. I keep doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Director Kindig. We had uh, one meeting of the <clears throat> Joint Operating Committee of York Tech uh, back in January. They reported that the uh, field house that they built several years ago is now paid off and that came in $25,000 under budget. So that 25,000 was put into a savings account to earn interest. Okay, excellent. Just for clarity, um, my report was on the JOC, okay. yours is on the authority. Okay. So, okay, very good. All right, the next report is uh, recognized Director Miller for the LIU 12 York Learning Center Joint Authority. So LIU 12 met, but I have not received any um, notes from that last meeting in April. Um, our York Learning Center Joint Authority, I attended the meeting on um, March 20th. We had a tour of the building before the meeting began, and then we actually got to tour the building on Friday with students there. And so we were able to go into some of the classrooms, which was wonderful to see what happens in that building. Um, there is 150 students currently enrolled. They have a capacity of 185. Right now, each district pays $67,250, um, no matter the number of seats. They get a lot of money, not a lot, but they get money from rental income, from volleyball teams, Head Start. Um, there is an LIU Health Center and Identigo there, so they are getting some income that way. Um, they are doing a feasibility study right now, currently on the building. It's a very old building, and they are really looking at um, the conditions of that building. They recently installed cameras from the same grant that we used in our district, um, and it is a very welcoming board, so it was very, very enjoyable to attend. So that's it. Thank you, Director Miller. Recognize Director Miller, I'm sorry, Director Whitmer for the legislative report. Uh, just that the House has been uh, meeting for their different committees. I've been trying to follow education, nothing as of yet, and we're still waiting on the governor's budget in regards to his disbursement for education. Excellent. Thank you for that. Director Wolverton for the ICDC. Yes. Uh, last meeting, what they're doing is continuing to plan what they want to do as far as uh, the organization yeah. of a rental, I, I shouldn't say rental, but the usage of the high school for a classroom or two in the fall in regards to uh, 
senior citizens basically with the idea of employment when it comes to their, uh, uh, if you want to call it, uh, I'm trying to think of a really nice word to say this, bringing them up to power, you know, if, if, in regards to their techniques of uh, uh, interviewing and things of that nature as they feel. Are they, are they intending to make uh, an approach to the school administration regarding they are. the request? They are. Okay. So they're not relaying it through you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that report. Uh, the PSBA report. Director Meese? Um, as part of the PSBA, <clears throat> school directors are invited to participate in a separate process to select PSBA's legislative priorities for the 2025-2026 session of the General Assembly. A lot of what Carmen and I do kind of coexists. So um, just PSBA represents us as a school board on the legislative side at, at, the, at the state level. Um, so anyway, I gave you guys a um, copy of the current legislative platform from PSBA. So this is what they're going to be um, lobbying for in the 2025-2026 school year. So you guys have the um, opportunity to add or remove from that legislative platform. Um, the deadline to submit those recommendations is June 28th. Um, so any recommendations that you guys make or things that you want to pull out of that legislative platform will have to be approved by the board. Um, so we would have to go through that. I mean, it's a short timeline, but they just gave that to me. So, so that's and a, then is that a deadline for comments? Is that correct. what they're calling it? Yes. Yes. Comments. PSBA. All right. And then Mrs. Weaver would be the one to submit the recommendations via the online portal. So it's a pretty simple process. It just would require you guys reading through the current platform. Um, a couple notes that I made, you know, we've talked a lot about the cyber charter, school tuitions, um, and maybe getting additional special education help. So I invite you to read through it um, and email me with any um, additional items that you'd like to add, and then I can compile those, present them to the board, and then give them to Mrs. Weaver, and she can submit them. I have one question here. So the, the they don't use the uh, convention of bold type indicates changes to a previous one, I'm assuming. So that when they highlight something, it's just highlight because that's the main heading? Yes, that is okay. correct. Yep, yep. All right, so I think this is, I'll have to study through this. So I appreciate you bringing this resource to You're us. You're welcome. And at least you guys would know, you know, I think we're kind of in the dark as to what PSBA does for the board um, besides training and helping with policies. But this is something new that I, that I actually learned that they, that they give us the opportunity to have input on, so. So when they go to the Hill, if yes. they don't receive comments, they're going to represent that all the school boards out there want this. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yes. When I say the Hill, it's not really the Hill, but I mean. Conjunction, yeah. Junction. Harrisburg. Right. Harrisburg. Yeah. Been on the Hill. Yep. Well, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Cartwright is recognized for the superintendent's report. I'm going to postpone my report till next month. Okay, thank you. This uh, takes us to our second public comment period. Uh, same rules as uh, the first one, except the time limits have changed. I'll try to pay closer attention to that. I was so interested in some of the comments that I, I wish I had it right in front of me. So when I'm looking at the speaker, the clock was here, but I try to keep an eye on the clock over here as well. Um, anyone seeking to make public comment during the second period? Hi, I'm Gina. Hello? Okay. Hi, I'm Gina Myers. I'm here, actually. I have two letters from two residents who could not attend tonight's meeting. The one is from Carolyn Coleman. Uh, she, she's at 6420 DuPont Avenue in Dover. She says, I am hoping we will not have an increase in taxes. I am an 81-year-old widow not easy getting by on one check. Taxes going up, gas, health insurance, groceries, 
electric. I think she also pays rent to a mobile home park, but she owns her own mobile home. So I think she still pays Dover taxes. So um, anyway, she, um, she also says, I also have a neighbor who has the same issues. Sincerely, Carolyn Coleman. And then this other letter is from another senior. Um, her name is Peggy Ryder, and she lives on Village Road. Uh, she says, for almost 45 years, we have lived on Village Road, Weigelstown, Dover, PA. In all that time, I have never felt it necessary to voice my opinion on the school board or local taxes. Well, times have changed. In speaking with neighbors and other residents of the area, very few are in favor of more taxes to be added to the burden they are currently facing, trying to figure out how to pay for food, gas, medical expense, ever increasing utilities. Dover just enacted a 9% increase in sewer and water and everything else. People like us, who are on fixed income can't handle much more. Give us a break. We have worked, scraped, saved, and we're finally able to purchase a home, and now people are demanding we be taxed more um, for educating their kids. What about all the low-income Section 8 housing, what has been constructed in Dover? Between them and the, and the um, residents, yeah. no thank you to new taxes, higher taxes. Thank you. Thank you. I promise it'll be super fast. Um, <clears throat> first, thank you for your candor and honesty tonight. It was refreshing. Um, when you're focusing on the fear of us having a $3 million lawsuit in the future, um, I would like to also ask you to keep in mind of the future, um, that in the future, after this budget is passed, I fear the potential of joining with the ILC law firm could put us in danger with another lawsuit. Please keep that in mind with policies that might be coming forward with them. Um, I also don't think this is a political, but there are a few things in the governor's budget that um, are going to help schools and that could help us, such as the cyber charter school funding um, and the caps on that. So I suggest you contact your elected, elected officials, let them know how you, if you support that or not. And then I just learned about two minutes ago that there are um, sheets outside of the uh, door that actually has the numbers and contact information on the elected officials. So I just suggest you do that. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Kenneth Moritz, Dover Township again. Uh, not sure if I, if this is a place to bring it up, but I have a, an out of the box question. Does anybody on the school board know any of the representatives in the state level? And if so, it won't happen immediately, but talk to them about maybe increasing the sales tax for school districts. I came from a state that used that did that. The state sales tax was six percent, but the school district could add one percent to that. So you pay seven percent, and all that money would then come to the school district. You said about you're go you're waiting for state money, and the state does give the school districts money. Well, that's coming instead of my left pocket, it's come out of my right pocket because I pay taxes in the state level too. So, but by doing the sales tax, everybody gets it. People that have uh, homes and people that are uh, renting. So if you know somebody, you can put the, the word out and maybe they'll think about it. Maybe they won't. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Moritz. Kara Hetrick, I signed in. Um, thank you, Mr. Hogan, for your statements at last week's board meeting. I appreciate you trying to shed some light on where the board is at in regards to the budget. I also appreciated you and Mrs. Miller's interest in our elementary band program, and I would be thrilled if you would be op open to bringing more music to our schools in the future. I come to these meetings because of my personal connection to the Dover School District, especially Live Elementary. We were a live family for nine years. 
When I had cancer, Live took care of my boys and our family. Coming to these meetings and advocating for the students and staff of this district is the very least I can do. I have always been involved in this district and I will continue to be involved. One cost that is increasingly significant for next year is Cyber Charter. Cyber Charter will cost us a half a million more next year and over $3 million next year. These costs are not anything we can control and the money that we are spending on that is less money that we can spend on our Dover students. It is extremely concerning to hear that the ABC group received campaign contributions from cyber charter connected organizations. I hope that the board continues to make the best decisions for the students of this district. My last comment is about Mr. My last comment is about Mr. Bradshaw. This is Mr. Bradshaw's last year with us. He has spent decades here in Dover and has built a nationally recognized band program. He has been coming to these meetings month after month pleading for his music department. For this to be the last for, for this to be the way he spends his last months here with us is terrible. We should be sending him off with to retirement with appreciation and respect. And I hope that we can recognize him in a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hatcher. James Jenner, um, I just want to recognize the school board for all the work that they've done so far and what I expect them to do in the future. When I hear comments of thinking out of the box, that resonates with me because you don't accept the status quo. You look for solutions. I also think if you take the time to look at the administrations and what's happening, I think there's money to be had there to save even more for the future of this district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yinger. Doug McGurn, 3613 Kimberly Lane, Dover, Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you all for your commitment to this district. Again, I know it's not easy doing what you're doing. You're not getting paid for what you're doing. You're doing what's right for our students and our staff. Uh, I was going to read a quote from Stan Lee. It says, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, it actually comes from a first century parable, uh, sort of uh, Democles. Simply stated that power can simply be enjoyed for its privileges alone, but necessarily makes its holders morally responsible both for what they choose to do with it and what they fail to do with it. I understand costs are up everywhere, and I feel bad for our seniors. I also feel bad for our students that they're put in a position with the exit of Washington Township, which was you know, no fault of their own. But I've seen my own property value go up 57% in the last seven years. Uh, my property is still assessed at 2017 values. The state hasn't assessed property values in over 20 years. So there's a big curve coming, and we're all going to be paying more taxes. Nobody wants to pay more taxes, but unfortunately, it's what we have to do. When I looked at the budget, um, proposed budget from March 12th, on page 21, it looks like we're going to have a five-year uh, projected deficit of $15 million. I don't know how we're going to overcome that. We're already using the budget. We don't want to raise taxes, but we have a big problem in our future. So again, I wish you luck. We're here to support you, but things have to change. Thank you, Mr. McGurn. Anyone else? All right, the public comment period is closed. We'll go now to comments and ob observations from the board members. Where did I, which side did I start on last month? Right nope. here. I started over here, so we'll start over on my left uh, with Director Wolverton. No, I just want to again thank uh, Dr. Cartwright and her staff for their support when I'm calling in for some of the questions that I've had to ask that uh, some parents have asked me and uh, their rapid response. Other than that, I have nothing. Thank you. Director Whitmer. 
I guess I just want to say, I know this time of year is, is stressful. A lot of tensions are high and um, I sometimes forget to thank, you know, the people behind the scenes working hard and I want to make sure that they know that we believe they're competent and that they are doing a good job. So I thank them for that. Um, and I also want to thank just the public for offering comment and um, helping us to look for solutions. And I hope that that continues. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Meese. I don't have anything. Dr. McKinney. Um, yeah, I guess I'll echo <laughs> Director Wolverton's thanks to the administration through this process. It's been a quite a learning curve, but I think working forward, we'll, we'll do a much more streamlined job of getting this done as we learn more. I want to thank the everyone here for staying, for being engaged, for speaking up, whether I agree with you or not. Let's let's do this together. So that's it. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Dr. Cartwright. Yeah, thank you, Director Kendig. No, I ha I don't have any comments. <coughs> Director Emick. No comments. Director Miller. I just do appreciate everybody being here. It's a long time to sit. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, I am enjoying getting into the schools. Um, the presentation reminded me of something that we had seen in the high school um, where they had, were making using um, inertia. So I just think it's all building and it's good to see that. So um, yes, thank you to everyone working hard. Thank you. Uh, Director Hogan. No comment. I'm, yeah. Councilor Pratt. Nothing to add to this evening. Nothing. Okay. Well, I appreciate the hard work of our directors and our administration. When I look to my side and I see pages and pages of handwritten notes that a director brings because they've been crun crunching the numbers and, and uh, trying to work this out, I see dedication to duty. I, I know that there's been a lot of conversation over these last months on budget. And we've heard a lot from the public. Uh, some of it is it's difficult to hear, but we need to hear it. We need the, the public to be engaged, and you have been. I applaud that and thank you for that. And I know it's difficult to accept thanks from someone that you may not agree with, and I know that's difficult as well. It's the same on our side, too. You know, there's a tendency to want to take things personal, but we have to remember, you know, what what we signed up to do and what we're um, tasked with doing. Uh, we cannot, you know, present a deficit in the budget. Uh, it sounds like we have some general agreement to move forward with the preliminary budget. And I think that's a major step forward for this, uh, for this board. And uh, hopefully the, the tenor of our meetings um, will lighten up a little bit, but we know that there's always things to disagree on, but we don't run away from disagreement. We, uh, we welcome it because it challenges our ways of thinking and they, we, they need to be challenged. So we thank you for that. Um, I just can't thank the board enough from the, for the amount of engagement I've seen in this budget discussion. I know we're still two months away from having this thing behind us. So, uh, but I do think we made a big step forward tonight. And I thank you for that. Um, I also want to just thank Director Kendig uh, for the level of time that I know that he puts into this. Um, and and the, like I mentioned in the number crunching before, uh, these things don't happen overnight. A lot of research goes into the positions he takes. I know there's been some criticism in terms of how points are expressed. But I know where his heart is, and I appreciate um, uh, the diversity of opinion that he brings to the board. Our future meetings, going to our next agenda item, um, future meetings, May 14th, we have a board planning meeting at 7 p.m. Again, just as a reminder, that is the meeting where we discuss and deliberate. You heard us tonight going through without much discussion because we've had pretty robust discussion in our planning meeting. And at that planning meeting uh, last month, uh, combined with our executive sessions that we, that we held, we were here quite some time. 
Um, and it didn't, we also had a special meeting that night. So we were here, um, I think it was after midnight when I left, uh, but our meeting was around 1130 when we finished, if I remember correctly. Um, so I encourage the members of the public to attend that meeting. Then May 21st, we have our board meeting. That will be the meeting where we will, uh, in addition to other business items, we'll take up that preliminary budget, which must be approved in May and must uh, uh, sit out there approved for 30 days before we can take up the final budget, which, as we said before, that's the reason we changed the June meeting date um, to, in order to provide that interval. That's all we have for tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make that motion. Director Emig moves. Is there a second? I'll second to adjourning in record time. Okay. <laughs> Director McKinney seconds the motion. Is there any opposition?